Good morning and welcome to Palm Sunday Worship. We'll be combining video from here at First Press Church in Fairbanks with our Pastor Donald Baird in Sacramento, as well as music from Kathleen Fagri, Jenna Dreidoppel, Stephanie Roselle, and maybe others, of course, you at home. So uh, enjoy the transitions, enjoy the lovely Palm Sundays. If you don't already have your palms, uh, go press pause and grab a, a spruce branch from outside in the yard and join us for Palm Sunday worship as we usher in Holy Week, remembering and celebrating all that Jesus has done, is doing, and will continue to do for us. Good morning, Fairbanks. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church's virtual worship service. I don't know how comfortable you are with doing worship virtually, but for me, it's a totally brand new experience, and it feels like I am back in school, I think, like the first grade. Um, before we begin our time of worship, I want to bring to your attention some of the uh, things that are still happening here at First Presbyterian Church. Um, the office is still open. We're receiving phone calls five days a week from uh, 9 o'clock to 4.30. And uh, you can see that number. On the bottom of the screen, it's 907-452-2406. Uh, and just call if you have any particular concerns or any way we can help you. Also, the youth group actually is meeting more often than it normally does. It meets every day at 1 o'clock, and you can tag into that with Zoom. And uh, just simply call uh, David Boer, our youth pastor. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, and you can now see his email on the bottom of the screen. We are uh, continuing to have worship, and it will begin every Sunday at 8.30, and then you can actually tag into that worship service um, at, from uh, any time of the day, any day of the week after that. Um, just simply go to um, First Presbyterian Church Fairbanks website, and there's a link there. Just push on that link and join us for worship. Also, on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, there's going to be a Bible study class led by Brian Roselle, who is going to be leading us in a study of the Gospel of Matthew. And you can also go to the Presbyterian, First Presbyterian Church webpage. And again, there will be a link for that Bible study. Um, there are small groups still meeting. If you want to belong to one, virtually. You can do that through uh, Zoom by um, contacting uh, Terry and Paul Reichert with, through their email, and you can now see that email on the bottom of the screen. And they meet every Friday at 6.30, and you're sure welcome to join them if you want to. The uh, food bank is uh, continuing to uh, function and to distribute food on Wednesdays from 2 to 4 o'clock. And if you know somebody who needs uh, food, uh, be sure and contact the church. Also on Monday, Thursday, April the 9th, we're going to be having a worship service. This will be celebrating the first time that Jesus had communion with his disciples and invites us to join him. Um, we're going to be doing a communion service at 7 o'clock. Now, you need to do some preparation for that. So before 7 o'clock on Thursday, go out to the grocery store and get a small bottle of grape juice and some bread. It can be any kind of bread you want, um, and include that. Bring it home and include that in the worship service. So pour the grape juice into a, a cup or a glass and uh, break the bread. And uh, you can do this any way you want to. The Bible doesn't tell us how we're supposed to do it. It just tells us that we're supposed to do it. So we'll see you on Monday, Thursday, celebrating communion and uh, the Lord's Supper. Then on Friday, the day after Thursday, on the 10th of April, we're going to celebrate together the uh, day when Jesus is crucified and remembering the story, the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Um, we're going to celebrate that on prayer and in fasting. All you need in preparation for that is a Bible, and we do hope that you will um, uh, open those uh, texts to the um, uh, and and intersperse the texts of the Psalms and uh, and the last words of Jesus with prayer 
uh, and we encourage you to, if you can, to fast beginning um, with the sunrise and, um, and then continuing until the end of the day. So that will be Good Friday. Um, Easter, um, you get to also to participate in the preparation. So Easter is going to begin again at 8.30 at First Presbyterian Church through this um, link. And um, during that worship service, we're going to be taking flowers and we we're decorating a cross down at the church. But you can do this at your home with your own flowers. Now, you need to go out and pick up some flowers uh, before that. But um, feel free to let this be an, uh, an interactive experience of worship. Well, this is um, what we're going to be doing this coming week. And we encourage you to be a part of it and let Jesus Christ continue to be the focus and the center of your worship time. Let us begin our time of worship then with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special day, uh, Palm Sunday. And we thank you for the gift of a Savior who comes marching into not just the city of Jerusalem, but into our own lives. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as we welcome him and cheer his coming, that we may experience a very real presence, a very life-changing presence, so that indeed our lives are transformed, having celebrated this special week in his name. And so we pray this in that name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for the call to worship. This is a day of joyous welcome, yet joy is tempered by impending doom. We welcome Christ with waving branches. We wait with Christ through hours of agony. Our leader comes humbly, riding the donkey, Blessed is the one who comes in God's name. Jesus rides in the tumult of our lives. People still oppose the way of love. Yet love prevails in spite of opposition. Give thanks that God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to us the gates of righteousness. Let us enter in the light of God's salvation. Please join us as we sing all glory, laud, and honor. confess our common sin and our belief in a God who forgives. Holy God, we have blamed you when the Hosannas die and the parade turns into a mob scene. 
We heap our doubts on you, even though our inaction adds power to those who shout, Crucify! We rebel against the risks of discipleship. Why raise our voices against the evil that we see? One voice simply becomes one more victim. O oh God, we protest, but we know deep down that the victim of our silence is the way of love, the way of life. Forgive our cowardice. Help us to stand with Christ in a world that has forgotten humility and obedience to you. O oh God, we want to be faithful. Why does it cost so much? Amen. Let's take a moment of silence to confess our own personal sin. Hear these words of assurance and forgiveness. God does not forsake us in times of terror, in times of suffering. We are not alone. In Christ, we are strengthened as we watch and as we pray. We receive courage to love in the face of ridicule, to act for truth amid the oppressive forces of deceit. Love is at the heart of the gospel, bringing us to new beginning, to resurrection life in all of its fullness. Let's celebrate by singing the Gloria Patri. ask as you are able uh, to continue to present tithes and offerings uh, by contributing online or, or mailing in your tithe or your offering to the church office. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. But uh, if you will, in prayer and in spirit, um, let's lift up all our offerings of, of time and treasure of prayer and spirit. Lord God, we present these offerings trusting that you will indeed Use them for the glory of your kingdom, for the good of your creation. We dedicate them to you and to your work in the name of Jesus, asking that you magnify, amplify, and multiply them so that every hungry mouth may be fed and every hungry soul may find hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. continue to pray for all of our healthcare workers, our nurses, our doctors, our uh, hospital workers, our lab techs. Pray for all those who are continuing to, to go to work, to face extra risk in this time, and those who are staying home to work. And of course, uh, we pray with those and for those who are um, laid off or furloughed or, or looking for work. We certainly are with you, and we, we pray for God's will to be done for for people to be able to, to work and to serve as we all long to do in a more normal setting. We're also going to pray for Bunny Boykin. Uh, we heard from her yesterday uh, that she's doing well. She is not uh, tested positive. In fact, she tested negative for COVID-19 there at the Denali Center. Uh, we'll continue to pray for, for all the folks, the residents and the staff in Denali Center and Pioneer Home. Um, if you have prayer requests, you can send them to me. Uh, at my email address, which will appear at the bottom of the screen, or in our FPC Prayers and Praises on Facebook. Uh, do join that group and, and continue to let us know what your prayer requests might be. 
I also want to pray for Adam Benson. Uh, Julie Benson usually uh, sings with us a couple times a month at the 11 o'clock service. Her husband Adam has tested positive for COVID-19, so we definitely want to lift him up in prayer for health and healing. So please pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We ask that you would continue to bless us, to walk with us, um, to inspire us, to, to stir up your spirit in us, to give us courage to act when we need to act, uh, to give us courage to be still and to trust in you when that time has come. So God, we, we pray for, for Bunny Boykin, for Adam Benson, for all of those in our community and around the world who are sick, um, especially those facing COVID-19, but for anyone who is struggling with an illness, a condition, or an injury, we pray for healing, we pray for strength. Lord God, we ask that your presence would guide them and bring healing swiftly in this time. God, we pray for all of our medical workers, our nurses, our doctors, our custodians, everyone who is there on the front lines, um, taking care of patients, all those folks that are making sure that people are, are well-fed and warm and safe. God, we lift them up in prayer, give them strong, give them energy where they feel like they have none, give us hope where we feel like we have none. And God, we lean hard on you in this time. We ask that as we walk through your gospel stories of entering Jerusalem, facing your own death, that we would recognize our own vulnerability, our own need, and that we would go with you in our baptismal promises into your death and come out through resurrection. God, we lean hard on the hope of your resurrection, not just at the end, but here in this moment. We pray for resurrection life, resurrection spirit. We pray for new life, for new hope. Lord God, we lean hard on you. and We trust in Jesus as God's love revealed to us when he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello! Boys and girls, this is your time of the worship service. Get your palm branches out. We've got a parade to do, just like they had a parade when Jesus came marching into Jerusalem. You know, in that parade, by the way, everybody who is in the sixth grade or younger is sure welcome to be a part of this parade. But if you're older than the sixth grader, we'll let you in this day at all, this day to join us. This parade is better with more people. Well, in this parade, the people were cheering Jesus as he was coming into Jerusalem. They were saying that he was the new king, the king of the whole world. And they were so happy to see him, they began to sing and they shout and to march and they lay their clothes in front of his animal so that his didn't hurt his feet when he was walking on the street. And they also waved their palm branches because, you see, they didn't have any flags. So this was the best thing they could get a hold of to wave and cheer with. Well, they cheered and cheered. And one of the words they used in their cheering was Hosanna. You know what Hosanna means? Hosanna means help. That's a good word to use if you fall into the Chena River and, and need some help to get out. Don't forget, they weren't cheering glory to God or um, hallelujah. They were cheering Hosanna, which they were saying, help me, help me, help me. So if you need some help, say Hosanna. Well, that was a part of their song because they knew God could help them. So we're going to have our parade here today. All right. So get your palms. We're going to parade around the house, all right? Let's have a parade. Everybody get up. Everybody. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name.
Was that a nice parade? Sure glad you can join me on that parade because you know we only have one Palm Sunday every year. We'll have to wait for another year before we have another parade like that. Well, I want you to remember though, there's a lot to be cheering about, no matter whether you're having a good day or a bad day, because Jesus is, going, is the king and he is going to be the one who loves you and heals you and keeps you safe all the time, now and forever. So let's now have a prayer and then we'll get back to worship, all right? Dear Lord, thank you for coming into our lives like you came into Jerusalem and giving us so much to celebrate and to sing about. I pray, O oh Lord, that there may never be a time we will forget you're the real king, the king of all things and all people. Amen. Okay, let's get back to worship again. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do with these slightly used palm branches, but I'll tell you what some people do. They let them dry out and then they burn them. And then they take those ashes next year and they make ashes for crossing themselves on the forehead on um, Ash Wednesday. Hmm. Might save your palm branches for that. Okay, let's get back to worship. Please join us as we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Sunday, and uh, we're going to be taking a look at the story that is behind the first Palm Sunday. We read about this story in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the one we're going to look at this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke, uh, because Luke has been the guide for all of our uh, worship services this whole year. So we're going to look at the 19th chapter of Luke, on the beginning with the 28th verse. And this is the word of God as we find it in Holy Scripture. And when he had had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, Jesus wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a bar barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you do not know the time of your visitation. Amen. That is the word of God. And the story of Palm Sunday, our story today, I don't know if you resonated with any part of that, but certainly having lived that, as I know you have for the last week or two with this coronavirus, surely those words about being hemmed in and barricaded and surrounded on every side, tearing you down to the ground, certainly resonates our experiences are obviously not unique to us. And so I think the word of God, as it was brought to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, is the same word being brought to us today. You know, I like to look at the positive side of things. And as I look at the Palm Sunday time, I think in terms of what it is that God wants for us to to learn. And, and I look for the positive side of it, thinking, well, I have learned some things I never needed before, like how to work Zoom. I used to think that Zoom was what airplanes did. It now is a program. And I used to think that uh, relationships had to be in physical proximity with one another to be significant. And I'm finding that's not necessarily true. In fact, I've had relationships with uh, my grandchildren and uh, and meetings with uh, members and elders of First Presbyterian Church this last week. And we could see each other and talk to each other. I mean, what is a Presbyterian without a meeting? And I also have learned that I can live without sports uh, and late night comedians. And there there is a saturation point for the news, I mean, where you reach that enough is enough and I don't need to know anymore. Well, I don't know where you are, but I think we're going to get through this time and we're going to get through it together. Now, the story that we read this morning from the Bible, I think is so relevant. But I want to show to you some things in it that you may not have noticed as I read those texts. For example, did you notice how it began? And Jesus went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. Now you may have thought that's not particularly important. That's just kind of where Jesus started his journey into Jerusalem. And that would be true. But you know, there are many entrances into Jerusalem. And this was only one of them just like there's many entrances into Fairbanks. But this particular entrance for the Mount of Olives is one that the prophet Zechariah 
had said 500 years earlier was going to be the place from which the Messiah was going to come. The Messiah was going to come into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. So for Jesus now to come in from the Mount of Olives, I think was a clue for many of those who wondered whether or not he was the Messiah. And then you may have noticed that Jesus mounted on a donkey. You may have thought, well, that's a nice way to travel. But actually, a donkey was the one, was the animal that Zechariah had said the Messiah was going to ride coming into Jerusalem. Not just a donkey, but one that had never been ridden before. And so for Jesus to come in from the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey, carries its own message. And then, and then for the people to respond, they responded in ways that, well, was similar to the time when Judas and Maccabees rode into Jerusalem, victorious over the Seleucids, giving freedom to the Jews for the first time in hundreds of years. And when Judas rode into Jerusalem, the crowds, ecstatic with enthusiasm, ripped branches from the trees, palm trees, of course, and waved them like great flags. And they laid their clothes before his animal as he rode down to the temple. Well, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people saw this freedom fighter, this one like Judas Maccabees. And they did the same thing they did when Judas came in. They took the branches from the palm trees and waved them and sang, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Those are two different sayings, actually. The first one, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, is from the Psalms, the 118th Psalm. It's a song from the Book of Songs that the Jews would sing at this time of year during Holy Week. These are called the, the shouting songs, the, the halal. And this was the most famous of them all, the last one. And, and the psalm was speaking about a coming Messiah. Not only was it talking about a coming Messiah, it was talking about the Messiah as a king. They were thinking that this Messiah was to be like King David, great ruler, a great, a great uh, leader of the people. But this psalm, you may have noticed, quoted in this text from Luke, did not include the word Hosanna. That's because actually the psalm does include the word Hosanna. It just isn't quoted by Luke. You see, Luke quotes Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And verse 25, it begins, Lord, save us. Oh, that's Hosanna. Oh, Lord, grant us success. And then, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you see, the people knew how this psalm went. They didn't need Luke to tell them. It'd be like you hear somebody singing, Jesus loves me, this I, and then they stop. You know what the next word is because you know the psalm. Well, they knew this psalm 118. So Luke has Hosanna, but the people uh, uh, know how that psalm goes. Earlier in his ministry, Luke has Jesus responding to threats by the Pharisees, telling Jesus he has no authority and to keep quiet. Jesus says to the Pharisees, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent, were sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look at your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Get it? 
Jesus was telling them, two years before this event, you're going to say this psalm from Psalm 118. You're going to say it, and you're going to say it about me, said Jesus. And sure enough, Jesus was right, and they sang the psalm. Now, that second sentence that people sang on Palm Sunday, peace in heaven and glory in the highest, should be a very familiar psalm to you because that was the song that the angels sang at Christmas in Bethlehem. Remember? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Remember? Well, here the people who heard that song or heard about that song are now using the song sung by the angels at the birth of Jesus, now proclaiming him the Messiah. So you see, we have both the Old and the New Testament coming together on Palm Sunday, on this day, saying he is the promised Messiah. He is the Son of God, born of the Virgin in Bethlehem. But I want you to look at a particular verse that has intrigued me all these years. And the verse is verse 41. And there Jesus says, uh, Luke says, As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus weeps only twice in the Bible. The first time when he hears about his good friend Lazarus dying. They must have been great friends because it created a, for Jesus such sorrow. And as Jesus felt that sorrow, he wept. He was approached by Mary, uh, this bro the sister of Lazarus. And Jesus comes to, to Mary and says, where is he buried? Mary takes him to the tomb of Lazarus, where Jesus rolls the stone away and raises Lazarus from the dead. One of the things that has intrigued me about this, these verses that we read also is this saying that Jesus says, I tell you, if my followers keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, that's not an if. <laughs> I mean, the followers do keep quiet eventually. Or they cried, crucify him, crucify him. They are certainly not praising him. But stones, stones don't cry out. They're probably the most inanimate, non-communicative objects in all of the universe. I mean, that's why it makes it so funny that back, I remember a number of years ago, uh, they used to have pet rocks. And, and you could buy a pet rock to be your pet you would eventually find out that it just kind of lays there. Well, birds sing and trees whisper and brooks babble and donkeys bray, but rocks, they just kind of lay there. Well, Jesus says, the rocks will cry out. How do the rocks cry out? Well, first, do you remember? They cried out when Lazarus is raised from the dead as Jesus moves the stone. Jesus moves the stone and it cries out, he is alive. That's, that's what brings to mind then this parade, this Palm Sunday parade of Jesus into Jerusalem. Jesus is in Jerusalem to celebrate Holy Week, like all the other visitors there. Thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the Roman Empire come to Jerusalem to celebrate. And Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey into the city. And there, people recognize him, not just from where he came from, that is from the Mount of Olives, and what he's riding, the donkey, but also from what he's just done. He just raised Lazarus from the dead. And all the marvelous things that he said, and their enthusiasm and identity of him as the Messiah is overwhelming. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, they shout. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Well, most of these cries are songs to God. Palm branches are waved. 
garments are thrown on the streets. And the Pharisees, they're a bit anxious because these are the people who are identifying Jesus as the Messiah, not Jesus who's identifying himself as a, as a Messiah. These are the people. And so the Pharisees plead with Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And that's when Jesus says, if I did, and if they were silent, even the rocks would cry out. I think that's part of the significance of Palm Sunday. No, we're beginning Holy Week with virtual worship service. Can Palm Sunday have anything to say to us in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic? On Palm Sunday, the people in Jerusalem found out who Jesus is. And when they did, there was only one thing they could do. Cheer. Now, as the week progresses, People forget what they saw so clearly on Sunday. They forget it by Thursday. So when the people fall silent, the rocks speak up, not just with loserous stone across his tomb. There was also the man. Remember the man who was living among the tombs and he lived there uh, out of his mind. Luke says it this way, this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him, even with chains. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high? Swear to God, you won't torture me. But Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Well, the man came well, and Jesus said, Now go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Jesus heals the broken, cry the stones, as the madman left them behind in the tombs. Or you may remember the woman who was caught in adultery and who was brought to Jesus for his counsel in terms of what discipline should be invented upon her. And Luke tells us, the people who brought her made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Seacher, this woman was caught in an act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you was without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And at this, those who heard began to go away at a time, one at a time, the first until last, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, Jesus is not only the one who is, heals the broken, he's also the one who forgives the sinner. And the rocks cried out that fact on that day. And there you may remember then that Lazarus. So we have these stones speaking loudly of who Jesus is, even if those who knew him no longer could. It was the rocks who said, Jesus is the one who forgives. Jesus is the one who heals. Jesus is the one who saves. First thing that those who saw Jesus saw was a king. So they put their garments down before his animal. It sort of gave him the red carpet treatment as they would to a ruler. And they sang, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. How critical it is that 
we join our voices with theirs in singing that great song from the Halal. Followers as, as every day of Jesus followers is filled with news that more and more people are coming down with the coronavirus and even some are dying. Some of you may be sick with the coronavirus. I pray that God will come and heal you and speak his great message of love, declaring that he is the king. Coronavirus is not the king. And some would suggest the coronavirus is in charge now. But I beg to differ. God is still on the throne, and his power is not threatened or edited by a microscopic virus. So don't let this day silence your voice. Join the Palm Sunday crowd saying, Blessed is the King, the real King, who comes in the name of the Lord. Second Palm Sunday, we discover that Jesus Christ is a lover. Do you remember when he was looking down upon Jerusalem? Luke tells us as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus didn't weep for himself, though he knew he was heading for the cross. Jesus wept for Jerusalem and those who were in Jerusalem who didn't know who he was or what he could do for them or how much they needed him. Jesus continues to weep, I think, for us, for the people of our day here in Fairbanks. He not only cares, he also provided us for healing, for an openness to real life. And God, in fact, has prepared us, I think, for this day, this pandemic. You know, today we know how to develop a vaccine that will immune us from getting sick. Today we know how to test for the coronavirus. Today we know how to insulate ourselves while remaining in contact with one another through high technology. And you know, we couldn't do any of those things just 10 years ago. Can you imagine what it would be like today with the coronavirus if we didn't have any of those gifts from God? But God gave us those gifts in time for the virus. Now, I don't think God is causing this virus to infect people, but I think that he can use this time to again declare his glory and his authority. That is one of the messages of this day. And then also, Palm Sunday is when the crowds discover that Jesus Christ judges. You know, right after Jesus gets into town in Jerusalem, he goes to the temple where he cleanses it. Now you might say, well, why did he go to cleanse the temple? Why should he have gone to Pilate's house? That's where the evil was. Or, or gone to the to, uh uh, Caiaphas's house, the high priest. He starts with the temple because God knows that it's only with healthy, strong, spiritually committed people that the world can receive the blessings of God. We're forced to review and remember that we are and remain God's people. And we need to be strong in our faith so that Fairbanks can be strong and the world can be strong. Jesus is still cleaning the temple today, I believe, and he will judge all evil, including the coronavirus. But I think he also forces us in this time to examine what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be the church? And I think there's a message here that God gives to us, a message of, of humility, which is not a word that we hold up as a, as a high goal to achieve. Now, when that 
in our own day, it's sort of like, it's all up to us. Uh, we think that we don't really need to change anything. Social distancing, eh, forget it. Testing, not so important. Stockpiling masks and ventilators and hospital beds, nah, not necessary. We know what to do. So God says, like he did to those people in Jerusalem, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Oh, if we only knew. And he's doing his best to let us know. But let us know. And on that Palm Sunday, the people discovered Jesus as a Savior. The people saw Jesus, they cried out, Hosanna, help us, please. And our Lord accepted their words, and Jesus is going to help us. And he did, and he does. That's what makes it all worth the while. Jesus is the unifying voice. And I think this may be maybe the most important thing about the coronavirus. It's teaching us human beings something about ourselves and life and the way God meant it to be lived. Some have likened this battle with coronavirus as a war. Our battle with this virus, like other crises, has the power, I think, to bring us together as a world, as a common humanity, to discover things about ourselves. I remember World War II when I was a child how everybody saved everything and bought war bonds they couldn't afford and grew victory gardens. My family took in a Japanese family into our home during the war. It unified the nation. A war. I remember the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And we as a nation wept together. I recall 9-11, a different kind of a crisis. And as tragic as that was, it united our nation. Now, we have the coronavirus. I think it too can be a unifying power in this world teaching us how much we need and are responsible for one another. Ex-enemies are loaning and selling respirators and masks and suits to one another. Every scientist on earth, no matter their race or nationality, is now desperately working overtime to discover a vaccine for humanity. This is not just for ourselves or for themselves or for a nation. This is for all of us. We're learning that if I keep my neighbor healthy, I might actually be doing myself a favor. We're discovering what Jesus maybe really meant when he said, as you have done unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. And maybe we can see it in yet a, a different way. As you have done unto the least of these, this stranger who you are protecting from the coronavirus, as you have done it unto the least of these, You've done it unto yourself. When a vaccine is found, they'll all share it. Neighbors who once were strangers are looking out for one another. Knowing that the health of your neighbor may be the key to your own health. So I can't dismiss the possibility that God is using this crisis to bring the world to a new place, to a place, a new understanding of what it means to be my brother's keeper. God didn't cause this crisis, but to his glory, I believe he can use it. Remember the words of Jesus? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, said Jesus. Rejoice and be glad, because, because great is your reward in heaven. I think today we are discovering that and also great is your reward on earth. And the stones, they continue to speak of the one who is the Savior, the healer, the lover. We are told that there was a great earthquake on Easter morning, and the rocks cried out once again as a stone was rolled away from the empty tomb of Jesus, and the world met the risen Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, as we struggle with our own crises, we know that the King is still the King. And we can join the crowds in singing, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. O oh, Lord, heal our brokenness. Mend our loneliness and fill us with your spirit. Amen. Please join in singing Hosanna. you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.